Today on Applied Science, I'm going to describe how I built an image capture system for this vintage scanning electron microscope. This allows me to connect a modern computer to it and capture images directly. But first, let's take a look at an animation that I made today using this system. This is a two millimeter drill bit drilling into some lead metal. And I chose lead just because it's soft. I can't get a whole drill press inside the scanning electron microscope. So I'm basically using a, a makeshift drill press inside there. So the basic idea of this image capture system is to start with an analog video signal that the SEM is outputting and then digitize that using a microcontroller and send the digital values over USB to the computer. And then on the computer I'm running a processing.org script that just displays the image in real time and optionally allows me to save the frames. So this way I can just with you know two keystrokes uh, see an image and then save it and then advance the SEM so I can uh, get a, a, an easy sort of animation going. Okay, so let's talk about that analog signal. This microscope is capable of capturing images in real time. So if I move the drill bit inside the microscope, you can see in the, on the screen it's updating it at full speed. It's about 30 to 60 frames a second. But if you want a really high resolution image, we have to slow the scan way down. So the scope comes with this setting. And as you can see, it's building up the image line by line. And the whole thing takes about 10 seconds. So back in the day, uh, the way that you would actually make an image out of that is to hook up a Polaroid camera to this and then mount the camera to the front of the screen and let it uh, expose the film a line at a time. But of course we have better technology than that now, so let's talk about uh, today's solution. Since the designers of the microscope thought that you'd be using a camera to capture this slow scan image, unfortunately there's no port on the side of the scope that has a signal we can use. So I had to go probing around on the circuit board with the oscilloscope and with the help of the schematic here, uh, found a signal that will work just fine. It's actually quite a, a large range signal. It goes from negative 12 to 12. Uh, the reason being that the scope uses plus and minus 15 volt rails for its op amps so that when the op amp is railed all the way, it puts out about negative 12, or at least in this case. Uh, the signal is composite, so basically it's a raster scan. It's left to right, top to bottom, just like you saw on the screen. And when it gets to the end of a horizontal line, there's a sync pulse. In this case, it's about 126 microseconds long. And during the sync pulse, the voltage is as far negative as it can go, about negative 12 volts. Then there's analog data for 11.2 milliseconds, and this repeats for every horizontal line. And when we get to the bottom of the frame, there's a much longer pulse of about 10 milliseconds. So if we know uh, what the pulses are supposed to be, and we're listening to this signal, we can figure out uh, everything we need to to reconstruct the frame. Um, and at, this comes out to about a thousand lines per frame, and so the whole thing takes about 11 seconds. So if we want to get this into a microcontroller, the first step is to um, voltage translate it into something that won't destroy the microcontroller. In this case, I'm using the Teensy LC, which is a 3.3 volt microcontroller. So what we want to do is translate this negative 12 to 12 volt signal into 0 to 3.3. And we also want to do something else. Um, these sync pulses don't really carry any information about the image itself. I mean, it's timing information, but it's not uh, visual information. So if we were to compress this whole negative 12 to 12 range down to 0 to 3.3, a lot of our dynamic range would be wasted on this pulse. So what I'm going to do is separate the signal into just video and then just sync. So let's talk about the video first. I just ended up using two op amps. Uh, this could have been done with one, but uh, with two we invert the signal and then invert it back so that the sense of the signal is the same, not that it makes a huge difference, but whatever. Uh, so this first op amp is set up as a reducer. Usually you configure op amp circuits to amplify signals, but in this case we're actually attenuating. And then the second op amp is an offset. So uh, if we put it, um, the positive input on a potentiometer from negative 15 to plus 15, we can dial up where we want the offset to be. So after these two, we get a signal that is just the video data, hopefully taking up as much dynamic range as possible, 0 to 3.3, and the sync pulse is not really there anymore. Uh, then to recover the sync pulse, um, I have another op amp set up as a comparator. So its negative input is a fixed voltage between negative 15 and 15, and then there's a little bit of positive feedback, so that when the signal goes below the threshold, and I set the threshold to be something like, you know, negative 11. So as soon as this thing gets down to its most negative voltage, we know we have a sync pulse. And this uh, 
uh, comparator quickly snaps over. Now remember that this, this comparator is still using plus and minus 15 volt rails, but we want to get the signal to be 0 to 3.3. So what I did is I used a 74HC series inverter, and the data sheet even says that this thing is set up with protection diodes specifically to convert high voltage systems into low voltage systems. So I powered the inverter with the 3.3 volt rail from the microcontroller and then put a resistor here to limit the current so that even though this thing is snapping around from negative 15 to 15 almost, uh, when we get through the inverter, uh, we're down to just 0 to 3.3. So now we have our digital sync signal, which we can put into a digital pin on the microcontroller. And then we have our analog signal, which we put into an analog pin. And uh, like I said, I'm using the Teensy LC, uh, which gives us a bunch of options here. Here's a flowchart showing what the firmware does. We have our two signals in, the video analog signal and the digital sync signal, and we want to go through all this and have USB data out. Uh, so the way this is set up, the ADC is in free running mode, and it's running at about 142 kilohertz. Uh, actually, it's averaging four samples, but we're getting a result from it 142,000 times a second. And what we want to do is stop the ADC at the start of a sync pulse, so that when we restart the ADC, it will be nice and lined up with that falling edge of the sync pulse. Originally, I had the ADC free running all the time, and I tried to sync it up at the beginning of the pulse, but it didn't work very well because at certain stages of the ADC's function, you can't uh, stop and restart it with a deterministic amount of time. However, if you stop the system here, then what we can do is just measure the pulse width uh, using a timer function in the microcontroller, and then we'll know how long the pulse was, and we can restart the ADC and get very deterministic timing. Another trick I ran into is that since we have data coming from the ADC so fast, if we just filled up a buffer uh, from the ADC and then sent that out over USB, we would end up with some contention there eventually because the USB would be wanting to send the same data that's being written in by the ADC. And I think you could implement this with a loop buffer, uh, but I still couldn't quite figure it out since they're both reading and writing so quickly, uh, you end up with some weirdness there. And another nice thing is that uh, we'd like to fill up a buffer of at least 64 bytes before we actually do the USB transaction. It's super inefficient to uh, collect a sample and then send that one byte and then collect another sample and send that next byte. So the code that uh, operates the USB transaction would much prefer to have a 64-byte buffer or larger to work with. So the way that I solved this problem was to use ping-pong buffers. So the ADC is currently filling buffer A, while buffer B is being drained by the USB command, and then it, uh, with interrupts, disabled, snaps over, so it ping-pongs to the other side. And this seems to work really well. I don't know if um, there's an even sneakier way to do it, but the code is actually quite compact, and I'll post a link in the description so you can take a look. And then the last bit is just to uh, figure out how long this pulse was, and I used the elapsed micros uh, variable that um, is included in the Teensy libraries. And if it's over a certain amount, like if it's big enough to be a vertical sync pulse, then it dumps a different byte into the buffer, whereas if it's a short one, then it dumps you know, a, a horizontal byte, basically. Um, the ADC is running in 8-bit mode, and uh, all of the values except 0 and 1 are valid data values. I retained 0 and 1 to differentiate between the types of sync pulses, and probably eventually later I'll have other bits of encoding, but this just keeps things really simple. So it's one sample, one byte, just sent right over the USB, and then there's two special bytes for the sync. Here's a couple other things to keep in mind if you're doing a similar project. Um, USB hid is limited to about 64 kilobytes per second. Now it is guaranteed bandwidth, so a thousand times a second you can send a 64 byte packet, but in this case we're going uh, a bit faster. We're already up to 142 kilobytes per second, so we can't use HID. And if we use uh, an emulated serial port, that's fine. It's not guaranteed bandwidth, so if you plug a bunch of other stuff onto that same USB, uh, you may run out of bandwidth, but in this case we're, we're totally fine and it's running at about 142 KB per second. I originally started using the independent ADC clock that the Teensy has, or that the Freescale microcontroller has, and it says, oh, you should use this alternative clock if you're worried about noise coming from the system clock. And I thought, oh, great, well, that's, that's just what I want. But as it turns out, this is actually probably an RC timer inside the microcontroller, and it drifts like crazy. So I couldn't use that, and I switched back to the system clock. 
Also, if you search around on the net about using the Teensy for projects like this, like audio projects and things like that, you'll find that people are talking about this PDB, the Programmable Delay Block, which I had never heard of before reading about this in the Freescale controller. Um, I thought, well, if you want something with accurate timing, you would just set up a timer and use an interrupt and then put your code in there. But if you need something that's really deterministic, I mean really accurate, uh, you can't trust the interrupts because there could be uh, you know, a delay, an undetermined delay when the interrupt fires. And so it, you know, it leads to variable timing. So apparently this PDB is something that you can set up in the microcontroller that really runs very uh, deterministically and it triggers the ADC without really any code happening. And the Teensy 3.1 has this, but the Teensy LC doesn't. So when I started this project, I thought I had a 3.1 on the shelf, but I didn't. I had an LC and then I started coding it and thought, oh, well now it's a challenge. I get to make it work without the PDB. So by playing with interrupt priorities and writing the code as efficiently as I could, I actually got it to be very, very consistent. Uh, it's, it's performing as well as it possibly could. It's not dropping samples. So I thought that was a bit of a, a win. Uh, the ping pong buffer I described, like I say, I don't know if a circular buffer would be more elegant or whatever, but you can check it out and see what you think of my implementation there. And then finally, why am I not using DNA? Uh, most of the resources uh, about Teensy DMA refer to the 3.1 and the um, DMA controller on the LC is different, and I didn't really feel like learning about it, and I got enough performance out of the code the way it's written now, so I just went with that. Here's the setup. We've got the composite video signal coming in from the SEM here, and we have the USB connection going out here. And then to power the board, I've actually just tapped onto the circuit board that's part of the SEM, and we're getting ground plus and minus 15 volts out of it. And as you can see, the thing is completely probed up, so let's take a look at it on the scope. Here we can see everything on the oscilloscope. So the two analog channels, video and sync, are the two analog uh, inputs to the microcontroller. And then we have USB on the top here, and the scope is actually decoding the USB data in real time. And then we also have debug 1, 2, and 3 down here, which are digital signals that are generated by the microcontroller. So if you're really interested in this, you can download uh, the code that I posted and the comments actually indicate what debug 1, 2, and 3 are. So briefly, debug 3 is the interrupt service routine that handles the sync pulse. Debug 1 is the interrupt service routine that handles the analog digital converter. And debug 2 is the main loop of the program where we actually send the data out USB. So what's neat is that we can use the scope to measure the duty cycle uh, and see how much time is being spent by the microcontroller in each of these places. So as you can see, debug one is a, has a duty cycle of about 32%, which means that the processor is spending 32% of its time in the analog digital converter interrupt service routine, which is kind of high. I mean, that's, that's a lot of time. Uh, luckily, the job of this processor is just to digitize stuff and send it to the computer. So it's not too surprising that it's you know, spending a lot of time there. Um, we're also measuring the frequency, and so we can see that that interrupt routine for the analog digital converter fires at about 142 kilohertz, which is the sample rate of this system. Uh, these measurements are also being made just between the cursors. So you can see, as I was describing, when the sync pulse comes, we actually stop the ADC here and then restart it at the end of the pulse or at, so that we have a good uh, sync up here. So let me show you what happens if we don't have good sync up. Uh, this is an image that shows this jaggies problem, you know, the image is sort of jagged up there. And the reason is that on some lines, the ADC would be restarted like a few pixels too early or too late, depending on how you look at it. And um, it's kind of a small image problem, but I, I got to the point where I realized I could fix it, and so then I had to, and uh, syncing up or stopping the ADC and then starting it at the end of the sync pulse uh, solved the problem very well. Let's take a look at some of the data that's flowing through USB. So if we just do uh, a single acquisition here, um, the blue areas are data. So if we zoom in, we can scroll over to those transactions. And then if we look in here, each one of these is one of the bytes that are being sent through the USB pipe. If we ever see a zero in here, then we know that's the sync pulse. Of course, there's only one, and so it's very hard to see. And the scope has the ability to be triggered off of data that's flowing through the USB. So you can tell it uh, trigger when you see a zero in one of these, but I actually haven't got that to work. So I have to ask a tech expert um, how to set this up, or it seems like I've got it, but it's just not triggering. Another thing that's helpful for debugging is if we uh, get a single acquisition, 
we want to look through the data, but we don't want to use the magnifier. So this is actually pretty handy if what you're looking for is, is sort of time sensitive. So I can use this job wheel to scroll through and I can say, oh yeah, that's you know, the value that corresponds to the thing. And since we're also recording the analog value, you can kind of look for a blip that may have happened in the analog channel and look for it in the digital. But alternatively, uh, what we can do is pull up the event table and this is just sort of a listing of all the data that's gone through that USB pipe in this particular acquisition. Um, we're sending individual bytes, so half of each one of these uh, nibbles here is a, is a sample. And we could look through here and look for a zero and that sort of thing. You'll also notice that there's a lot of these NAC packets. Remember that USB is entirely controlled by the host, so the, the client the microcontroller can't tell the host that it wants to send data. It has to wait for the host to ask. So in this case, since the host is uh, pulling in the data as quickly as possible, it keeps sending requests to the microcontroller saying, you know, do you have any data? Do you have any data? And all of these NACs are the microcontroller responding, no, my buffer is not full and I don't have any data to send. Uh, and then eventually, uh, the computer asks and the microcontroller responds, yeah, the, data, the buffer is full so I can send you all this stuff. Uh, which is why it's helpful to have the buffer always filled up to close to the 64 byte maximum. That way uh, one transaction is full. Whereas if you send each byte all by themselves, uh, you end up wasting lots of transactions that are just carrying one byte when they could have been carrying up to 64. So here's the whole setup. You can see the computer tracks right along with the SEM in terms of the scan out and the update rate is truly real time so that you can see exactly what the SEM is uh, transmitting because the transfer rate isn't really that high. So after all that, you might be wondering, well, why didn't I just use the microcontroller to actually generate the scan rate instead of just you know, passively taking this slow 10 seconds per frame scan? Yeah, that's definitely kind of a phase two type thing. So um, using the analog outputs of the microcontroller to generate the X and Y scan would actually be helpful. Uh, but at this point, I'm mostly just interested in making animations. And if I can get away with just using uh, the existing scan rate, then that's OK. But I would like to experiment with high-speed acquisition, and um, we'll have to generate my own scan rates for that. Okay, see you next time. Bye.